is Erica Gupta, and I'm from the Fuel Cell Technologies office. And um, I'm going to go into my talk now about sustainable transportation, in particular fuel cell technology. But I want to start with a slide that shows a picture of the Northwest Passage. You might have seen the news last month. There was a new world record broken. For the first time, an English explorer was able to sail counterclockwise around the North Pole in a single summer season. Why was he able to do that? Well, before, they had to sail all the way down and around. But now, because of the loss of sea ice, right here, this explorer, David Heppelman, was able to sail directly through this channel, and it significantly cut down the time. And I think that's a nice illustration of some of the real impacts we're seeing from climate change and global warming. And part of what's causing that is the greenhouse gas emissions, or GHGs, like we would like to call them, both CO2 and methane and some others, but also particulate matter. So some of the particulate matter that's emitted actually cools, and some of it warms. It depends. Carbon black, more commonly known as soot, is one of the ones that actually has a warming effect. CO2 has such a significant impact that NASA, in July of 2014, launched a satellite dedicated just to the measurement of CO2 in the atmosphere. What's a little hard to see here is the scale. This is 390 parts per million to 405 parts per million, actual data measured by that satellite. That doesn't sound very important until you learn that for the last 800,000 years, the parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere has only varied between about 180 parts per million to 300 parts per million. It has not exceeded 300 parts per million until just the last 100 years. So that's an enormous change. And we know that by looking at ice cores, by looking at tree rings and glacial lengths, different uh, historical markers that we can read and look at and understand what it was previously. It takes almost 1,000 years for CO2 to leave our atmosphere and it is 80% of warming, so that's very significant. But the other particle I mentioned earlier is the carbon black. Now, this is the soot that gets into our atmosphere, also an animation from NASA. And I'm zooming in here on India. So right here is where Calcutta is. That's where my husband's from. I went to visit for about 10 days last winter. The entire time, I didn't get to see the sun. It should have been a bright, sunny day, but it was completely obscured by the soot in the air. You could look at it, and it was like looking at the moon. I don't want to live in a place where that can happen. The good news is, with carbon black, it can get out of our atmosphere in as little as a week. This is an easy thing to address. We just need to improve emission standards and make changes about how we use our energy and where we're using our energy from. Now, the good news is, we are moving forward. Your last speaker mentioned the Paris Agreement. This was last December. 195 nations got together in Paris. And they came to the world's first comprehensive agreement on climate change. That's almost every country in the world. And what they agreed to was to limit the Earth's temperature rise to well below 2 degrees C. They agreed that they would all publish what their current emissions are and what their targets would be. They'd get together and review those targets every five years and improve upon them until we can reach a point in 2050 when we can be carbon neutral. That means we're not emitting more carbon than the atmosphere and environment can handle and take back out. Another really important part of this agreement was assistance for developing nations. That means we won't be damaging the, com the economies of developing nations as they want to move forward by limiting what they can do in terms of energy use. We're going to help them and work with them to adopt clean and sustainable energy. Just last week, this agreement was ratified. That means we got all the signatures we need for it to enter into force, which will happen early next month. This is really, really exciting news for this industry. Now, in terms of what does that mean for us, here in the US, we need to reduce our carbon emissions by 80% in order to be carbon neutral by 2050. That's an enormous reduction. And we're going to get there through the all of the above energy strategy. That means it's not just one sector. 
It's not just one technology. It's all of them. And we need to work on clean coal, renewables, like wind, solar, clean transportation technologies, and really come with a strategy that addresses our emissions in all of our energy sectors. But I want to focus today on transportation. I'm in the Office of Sustainable Transportation, the Fuel Cell Technologies Office. And the first thing I want to do is remind you the size of our transportation system in the US. We travel four trillion miles a day on our roads. 2.2 people fly in our planes every day. Another 1.8 million travel by rail and 12.7 million travel on our metro systems. That's an enormous number of people that we need to move around our country. But it's not just the people, it's also the goods. We have a total of 16.6 billion tons of shipments every year. That's 45 million tons a day of goods that we are moving. And we're moving them over our roads, through our skies, on our rail systems, and also by ships. So we need technologies that can address all of these areas. And combined, transportation accounts for 27% of all of our greenhouse gas emissions in the US. It's 66% of our petroleum usage, and 85% of that is from on-road vehicles. So if we can address the on-road vehicle sector, we can make an enormous change. Now, one thing I want to point out is, as you know, the population's increasing. So our energy use is increasing. But another thing to note is that the use of vehicles is increasing even faster. So when we compare to 2000, we had 6 billion people, and we had about 750,000 vehicles, light duty vehicles or cars and trucks. In 2015, 7.3 billion people, but 1.2 billion vehicles. So the number of vehicles per person is increasing. Well, let's say for a minute we just want to replace the current vehicles that are on the roads in the US, not assuming any expansion. That's 240 million cars and trucks, light duty vehicles. We sell 16 million cars per year. So to change over a fleet, all the cars in the US, even without increasing them, that's 15 years. And if you think about it, the Toyota Prius was first introduced in 2001 probably around the time some of you were born, or at least were very little. Um, it's just now a common sight. It takes a really, really long time for adoption of new technologies to take place. So if we want to be carbon neutral by 2050, we need to make sure those technologies are ready by 2035, or even earlier, 2035 at the latest. And that's why what we're doing today really matters. Now, we have a lot of technologies that can help us reduce our emissions on the roads. There are the extended range heavy volt, hybrid electric vehicles, battery electric vehicles. But today, I want to focus on the fuel cell vehicle. This is a technology you may not have heard of, but it can address a lot of the transportation sector. So why fuel cells? One, they emit only water from the tailpipe. It's about the same amount as an internal combustion engine does today, but nothing else, which means they are a zero emission or ZEB vehicle. They also can significantly reduce the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions. So when we talk about life cycle, we're saying not just what's produced when you're driving your vehicle, but also what's produced when you manufacture that vehicle, when you manufacture the fuel the vehicle's using, as well as when you recycle the vehicle, after it goes to a junkyard. How are you reclaiming those parts? How is that material being recycled? What are all the greenhouse gas emissions associated with that? And if we produce the hydrogen from our domestic natural gas, we can already reduce our emissions by 50%. And if we did it from wind, using water electrolysis, where we take water and we split it into hydrogen and oxygen, we could get to 90%. That's a very clean technology. They're also very efficient, and you can refuel them in three to five minutes, just like you do your gasoline vehicle today. You can drive about 300 miles on a fill. So they're very efficient, and it's very similar to what you would experience today with your vehicles. Um, they're also very scalable. So while you can use them for the light-duty vehicles, you can also use them for medium and heavy-duty trucks, 
Uh, in Germany, they have a fuel cell train, and just last week, they announced a fuel cell plane. It took its first flight. It's only a four-seater, needs some work to scale up, but really, they can address a wide range of transportation technologies. Now, a little bit about how a fuel cell works. So it's a lot like a battery. It has an anode and a cathode. And what happens is instead of using up what's inside the battery, it'll keep running as long as it has hydrogen fuel supplied. So the hydrogen will come in, and when it reaches the uh, catalyst, it splits into its protons and electrons. The electron will move around the electric circuit, and the proton will move through the membrane. On the other side, it'll combine with the oxygen that you're bringing in and form water. And in that way, you're getting just water and heat out and producing electricity. So there's no combustion involved. The electricity is produced directly, and it's twice as efficient as today's combustion engine. So we've been doing a lot of work in the fuel cell technologies office in order to bring the cost down on these. And we've been able to reduce the cost in half since 2007. We've been able to do that through reducing the platinum that's used in the fuel cell by 5x, as well as increasing the durability of the fuel cells. And we're also looking for new catalysts, options that don't have any precious metals, or PGM as we call it, uh, materials, in order to bring those costs down even further. And it's not just the fuel cells we've worked on. We've also worked on the other systems too, everything that goes around that fuel cell. We engineers call that the balance of plant, or BOP. So we've worked on the humidifiers, the air compressors, as well as the storage vessels on board. And as a result, the cars are commercial. So right now you can buy a Toyota Mirai. Mirai, by the way, means future in Japanese. There is also the Hyundai Tucson, which is available for lease. And the Honda Clarity, which has been announced, will be available soon. You're going to get to see these two cars a little bit later today outside. And you'll have a chance to ask many more questions then if you're interested. So why do we not see them everywhere? It's because we need a fuel cell station network to support them. You need to be able to refuel these similar to how you refuel your gasoline engines. And that's a challenge. We would need 23,000 stations in order to have coast-to-coast -coast coverage. That's a lot of stations. But we have about 150,000 gasoline stations today. That's even more. There's a few things we need to do, though, to make this happen. One, we need to work on the station cost. Today, they cost anywhere between one to three million dollars each, depending on the technology and the size, how many vehicles they service. You know, each one can service hundreds of vehicles, but it is an expensive undertaking to put one of these in. We also need to work on the reliability to make sure that all the components and equipment in those stations work well so that when somebody comes into fuel, that fuel's available. But we've done this before. So if you think about the turn of the century, there were horses and carriages everywhere. There were definitely not gasoline vehicles on, and not gasoline stations on every corner. So when that infrastructure first started to expand, you had a lot of interesting methods for delivering the fuel. This is a picture of someone in 1901 pouring gasoline right out of a barrel into a bucket to fuel their car. A little mobile refueler that you would push around, hand pump the gasoline into the car. There's even a cash register right on there. Here's the precursor to the modern gasoline station. You can see the curbside pump there. And then another mobile refueler where you have a gasoline station that moved around the city and you'd fuel at different places throughout the day in order to service more vehicles. And that's actually a technology we're seeing adopted in some places today. In Japan, they have mobile refuelers that move around the city. They're in one location for a few hours. You can go online, reserve your fuel, sign up for your time slot so you know the fuel will be there and ready for you when you're ready to go fuel up your vehicle. They also had home refuelers when gasoline first came out. People would install fueling equipment at their house. And we have a prize right now, it's called the H Prize. It's a $1 million prize for the company or the group that can develop a home refueler that's economical. And we're seeing stations go in. So in California, there's more than 20 retail stations in place. California has offered $100 million for funding for these stations to put them in. And they want to focus first on these high population densities in Southern California, 
and Northern California, as well as connecting between the two in order to reach as many people as possible. And when we're saying open, it's really truly a retail station. You drive up with your vehicle, you pump your hydrogen, and then you pay with a credit card, same as you do today. Challenges we need to expand to the rest of the country. And the good news is we're starting to see that expansion. So in the Northeast, along with Oregon and California, there's an agreement between eight states to get 3.3 million ZEV, or zero, electric, zero emission vehicles, on the roads by 2025. And in the Northeast, we're starting to see hydrogen station plans there as well. So if you count the dots, you'll only count 19. There's four of the locations have not been announced yet. Don't try to make the numbers add up. But again, they're focusing on the high population density areas, starting with New York and Boston and connecting in between. So um, half of these stations are actually going in with no supportive funding. It's just private industry. Air Liquide and Toyota have teamed up to put in 12 of these stations. And I want to note also that there's global expansion. So we're seeing hydrogen stations go in in Scandinavia, in the Netherlands, in South Korea, France, Germany, Japan, and the UK, as well as others. So it's really global. And we can work together and learn from one another as we move the forward to put these stations in, in order to make this reality. I want to leave you today with a quote that my office director, Dr. Sunita Sachapal, really loves, and I, I can definitely understand why. It's from Napoleon Hill. It is literally true that you can succeed the best and the quickest by helping others to succeed. And I hope we all never forget that. Thank you.